afternoon today. Welcome back to On The Ball. Welcome back to another episode of Review The Prem, where we're going to review the midweek games. And obviously, me and Sim have scores of predicting the Premier League outcomes, which is 380 to 379 in Sim's favour. The way the scoring works, it's five points for a completely correct scoreline, one point for a correct result. And the star man, once you pick that man, you cannot pick them again for the rest of the season. Five points for a goal, two points for an assist. And uh, yeah, we do know there is one game happening tonight. and We'll review that on Predict The Prem tomorrow but let's get into the week's action and it's starting off at the Emirates 5-0 against Chelsea for Arsenal Sim went for 3-1 I went for 1-1 and Sim I did make that prediction before Cole Palmer and Malagusto were out and it could have been a different story if that was the case but look I think um Arsenal were in complete control. Chelsea did have a couple of chances in the first half, but I think Arsenal as well had their chances. And I think the second half, Arsenal just absolutely blew Chelsea away. I think it was a very much well-deserved victory. Really good performance from Arsenal. And Kai Havertz getting a double against his old club and uh, celebrating uh, like he really wanted it. Yeah, I think... Arsenal completely ran riot. I think Odegaard was in the mood as well in this yeah. game. And he's, re he's really turning it on recently. Obviously got the goal on the weekend against Wolves and really turned on the star on this one. Chelsea just couldn't live with him. And Arsenal absolutely tore them to shreds, especially in that second half. What I would say about the first half, it was a fairly even game, I think, in the first half. I think both sides had their chances. Chelsea, I think, guilty yet again of missing some r decent chances in that first half, which, uh, again, similar to what the story's been for them the whole season, getting in good positions. But not being clinical they were very much guilty of that on the weekend in the FA Cup game against Man City where they had a host of chances it wasn't quite at that level but they could have easily gone in at half time level um, with the chances they had albeit um, I would say Petrovic was still probably the busier keeper in that first half but second half it was just a demolition job Arsenal um, came out absolutely flying and um, uh, took took uh, Chelsea apart and it was um and it was exactly what they needed. They needed that kind of performance after a bit of stuttering in recent weeks, even against Wolves on the weekend. It wasn't the most convincing win, but they got over the line. Um, and they needed to kind of have a, an occasion where it was a procession, essentially. They were just taking Chelsea to was easy on the day um, and very much puts them in a really good position now in terms of that title challenge. Now City have two games in hand. They have to win both. That's exactly what Arsenal need to do, uh, put them in that kind of position. Um, from Chelsea's point of view, though, there's just something with them with second halves. They always collapse in the second half. It's really um, strange. Uh, I don't know whether it's just they're struggling to keep keep up with how Pochettino wants them to play for 90 minutes and I know Spurs when we had him as manager early on that was definitely a um, something that we struggled with where we couldn't keep up that pressing for 90 minutes until you know the second season so maybe that's just the case at the moment but obviously it was a massive collapse uh, for Chelsea in that second half yeah it really was and um when I saw the lineup just before the um, about an hour before kickoff, and I was thinking, I, I was so hopeful that Chelsea were going to get a result in this game. Then as soon as I saw the lineups, I was like, all right, this is going to be a demolition job for Arsenal, and that's exactly what it was. You're looking at um, players like Mikhailo Mudrik. You're looking at players like Enzo Fernandez, Moises Caicedo. They cost the best part of three million, three hundred million. These players, and they're just not uh, stepping up for the team. And um, when you play pay that much money for players like that, it's all right, all right, fine. It takes them. Um, a while to get to grips with things but we're talking about they've been at Chelsea for a while now I mean it's not they're not brand new signings anymore are they Enzo's um, signed last January so did Madrid you know what I mean they've been yeah. at Chelsea for a while now so they should really be stepping up for the team and showing their value and showing their worth and they're really not doing that any of them um, so that's got to be a massive cause for concern in terms of what you're saying about the second halves I think I looked at it yesterday if you just take second halves into account Chelsea would be sitting in the relegation zone they'll mm. be sitting 18th which yeah, is mad. that's what I'm saying. The, the, they have a real struggle. That's, that's got to be a massive concern. But then as well, that's something that can be fixed as an identifiable problem where Poch can clearly see they're not able to sustain his tactics for 90 minutes. So that's something he has to adjust. So um, really bad day at the office. And as well for Chelsea, things started to maybe not turn completely, but they started to look like, you know, eight games unbeaten, started to get a few good performances, especially um, at home. And it looked like maybe they can make a late challenge for Europe. And I guess that's not gone yet yet because they still got a few games in hand but of you know losing so badly 5-0 we'll see how it affects their confidence going forward but yeah Arsenal from their point of view um after a little stutter that was exactly what the doctor ordered essentially it's up to Tottenham now 
Definitely. It is up to Tottenham this weekend, but let's move on to Molyneux. Wolves nil, Bournemouth one. I went for one nil. Sim went for two one to Bournemouth. So Sim gets a point. I get a big fat five pointer for this one. And I thought Bournemouth played really well, uh, to be fair. Wolves were creating chances, but I thought throughout the game, Bournemouth did create the better chances. They did go down to 10 men. And then after that, after they did go down to 10 men, Wolves started to come back into the game and they did have a couple of goals disallowed, one right at the end. But I thought when you take into balance the whole play, Bournemouth were probably deserved victors. Yeah, and I think um, they were the ones on the front foot for a lot of the game. Again, Wolves suffering from a lot of their um, main players not being available. They did come off the bench and um, obviously Huang Hee Chan side, he did have a goal disallowed um, late on and so did I think Max Kilman also had a goal ruled out for a toenail offside. So that was really unfortunate. And I've seen that Wolves goal back, which they disallowed for. I, I honestly, I'm still... Not sure what it was disallowed for at this point. Um, they, I think it was because Cunha blocked Cliver, but I don't know. I've seen it a few times. I, I don't know why VAR thought the need to get involved in that one. I thought it was quite odd. So I thought Wolves were quite unlucky on that situation, but they could have easily been out of sight before those uh, moments as well. Obviously, Kirk has got a late red card with a um, really bad challenge. Um in that second half as well. So that that obviously put Bournemouth under pressure after that moment. But a really good win for Bournemouth. Going to Molyneux is not easy and um, come away with victory. Very, very impressive. And that puts them into the top half. So yeah. well, well done, dear Rola. Only three points behind West Ham, Bournemouth, which is mad <laughs> to think about where West Ham have been knocking around like sixth, seventh most of the season. Yeah, incredible. And they're only five points off sixth. So are they make, could they make a late charge for that? Can you imagine? Spot? If they do that, that is one of the best jobs I've seen um, in a long time, Vera Ola. What fixtures they got? Well, they do have some tough fixtures. So they got Brighton at Brighton at home. Then they go away to Arsenal, home to Brentford, and away to Chelsea. So I mean, it's tough. It is very very tough. Imagine uh, if they do it though. Like, what a story from Scott Parker walking out saying like the board aren't doing enough to to Iraola coming in uh, now after they had. Um, you know, the, uh, Gary O'Neill last season, to get to, into Europe, or even being close to Europe is a massive achievement for them. And even even Irola himself was one essentially one game away from getting mm. sacked. And the fact that he pulled that situation around and could even make a late um, title, a European charge, uh, hundred. I think, you know, that should be a manager of the year consideration. I mean, sure. Gary O'Neill was up for it last year and that was just for saving them from relegation. Yeah, exactly. So 100%, I think Irola should be up for it. Yeah. Next up, we'll go to Selhurst Park as Crystal Palace won two goals to nil against Newcastle and informed Newcastle side as well, which is very impressive. Oli Glasner and Crystal Palace. Sim went 3-1. I went 2-2. So Sim gets a point on the board for that one. Um, Mateta, what the hell is Oli Glasner feeding him? Another two goals that backs up his two goals in the last game as well crystal palace playing some really nice stuff and i thought they were heavily dominant throughout the game and uh, credit to them and even without um at least yeah. starting and fair, so fair play it was uh not an easy game we know newcastle as you say are in good form but glass has three wins on the bounce and the really impressive wins really impressive performances and what what i really like about it is they're starting to play some really good football you're starting to see a team in the in the um image of ollie glass now how he likes to play and it's so refreshing to see palace in this kind of mood and buzz around like they are and as they seems to be absolutely the hub of apps of absolutely all the football they play and everything seems to go through him and you've got a player of his quality uh, he's really getting the best out of him, which is really great to see. Um, but this formation they've played, um, they're a lot more intense, a lot more quicker, so much more in intensity they play with. And Newcastle couldn't live with it, especially off the ball. Um, they couldn't create, um, oh, sorry, on the ball. They really found it hard to create any uh, real openings against um uh, Palace and Palace really kept them at bay and they couldn't live with that front three and when Olise came on as well he was causing trouble but yeah as you say Mateta at the moment the form striker in the Premier League probably yeah. uh, with the amount of goals he's scoring I think it's nine in his last seven I think and um He's an absolute brute. But what I really like about him is um, when he's getting those uh, uh, finishing positions, he's got he's got this clinical edge all of a sudden, which he didn't seem to have beforehand. And he seems to really have improved his finishing. And maybe Glass is getting that the best out of him. He's getting in more scoring positions. He's playing him as a pure target man. And he's really, really benefiting from that. And when you're looking at Eberet Chiesa, what you were saying about him before, there are rumours that he could be out the door this uh, summer for Crystal Palace. And if he is... I do fear for Crystal Palace a little bit because where's that creativity going to come from? Um, good, yeah, 
uh, they would have to invest the... Look, what I would say about Palace is they have a good track record of investing in, um, but especially talents from the championship. But they're, they're, they're quite... They've got clearly a good scouting network. Look Adam Wharton's they, another one. Yeah, Wharton, look how they got Eze. Look at Olise. They, they don't usually spend lots of money, but they do smart business. And um, so I'm not saying that it's going to be easy to replace Eze, 100% not. But I do think they'll have contingency plans. I'm sure this it's not going to become news then. There's a good possibility Eze might mm. leave. So I'm sure they've got some backups in in line yeah absolutely and uh on the uh, perspective of Newcastle, you know, to not score a goal against this Crystal Palace side with Isak, Barnes, Gordon all starting on the pitch. I mean, that's got to be, um, I wouldn't say a worry, but I mean, they've been so clinical for the past, you know, month or so, these kind of players. They couldn't break down that Palace door. Yeah, well, Palace, obviously a different beast to what they were, but um, yeah, you have to say very, very disappointing for, for Newcastle. It looks like I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at here, it looks like they did um, play a back three. Maybe they tried to match up Palace to try and go toe to toe with them formation wise. And it was just, a, and it backfired a bit with Palace being a bit more used to that formation. So that would be disappointing for them. Um, obviously with a late charge into the top six, that was a bit of a blow. Obviously, with Man United winning, they go above three points above them now. Um, but all to play for, I think, from Newcastle's point of view. I think there's obviously Man United more than capable of dropping points from now to the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, Newcastle's sitting right now in the Conference League positions. Uh, for Newcastle to get Conference League this season with all the problems that they have had, I still think that's an okay season. It's okay, but when you've been in Champions League and then you're in Conference League, I think Europa League is a bit more acceptable. It's Conference League is that can't, you can't really say anything other than that as a step backwards. Of course it's a step backwards, but if Newcastle go and win the Conference League next season, they'll consider that a good season. Yeah, sure. That's true. No trophy in 50 years. So, yeah. yeah. Be massive for them. Uh, let's go to the Merseyside derby. Everton 2, Liverpool 0, uh, which essentially could be putting Liverpool out of the title race and, um, in turn, having Everton safe in the Premier League for another season. Sim went for 2-0 to Liverpool. I went for 2-1. And I thought Liverpool were poor, man. Uh, they really were. They did have their chances, as they always do. Uh, fluff their lines a little bit with the chance that they did have. But I thought Everton, for the most part, so resolute, took their chances. And um, I always thought it was going to be really difficult for Liverpool to go to Goodison. And that's exactly how it turned out. And it's uh, becoming a bit of a joke uh, because... Sean Dyche has worn a suit for the whole season. This game and the last game, he was wearing Everton track suit, and it's uh, three points in both games. Yeah, I think that should probably be that for Everton in terms of safety. Um, they're now eight points clear. We, um, no games now, but they're eight points clear of Luton uh, with four games to go. So I can't see Luton uh, recovering that situation. Or Burnley, they're 12. How many points clear of Burnley? They're 10 points clear of Burnley now. So one more win, and they're mathematically clear of Burnley as well. So I think fair play, really big win on a bigger occasion um really big performance as well have to say um i did think a lot you know in that first half uh liverpool had some real guilt edge opportunities which they'll be kicking themselves they didn't take i guess they could be saying the same for a lot of their games in the recent weeks where such presentable opportunities and then they don't take them and then those opportunities <clears throat> those opportunities seem to dry up a bit uh, later on in the game i think everton was so aggressive so resolute and they were and what was key was that when they did get the ball up the pitch and when they were counter-attacking um they did you know calvert -Lewin made it stick and he was creating opportunities and he was a handful for uh, Liverpool and a lot of um, Everton's threat was down to Calvert-Lewin how he was able to cause problems for Liverpool if he wasn't doing that it would be way too easy for Liverpool to just sustain attacks and and um, uh, have wave after wave of pressure and thanks to Calvert-Lewin um, I think they um, he did a great job for them so fair play to him um, I think the goals they conceded though they'll be massively disappointed with the, with the goals of the first one Massive mix-up between Canate and McAllister with the ball falling to Brown Fway. And obviously, he was able to squeeze it past um, Allison. And the second one, Calvaloon's completely free from a corner and able to head it home. And, uh, and while be disappointed again, similar to the Atalanta second half, where they just rushed things and looked completely like um, no, no composure. <clears throat> Sorry, no composure at all. <clears throat> I thought in the second half, um, late in that game, Liverpool just swinging crosses in the box and they were absolutely no composure never looked like scoring in that last half an hour as soon as they went 2-0 it was as if they had given up hope and um <clears throat> Carragher said after this defeat that's them out of the title race uh they are only three points behind mathematically but is that them dead I think pretty much I think when you look at the way that they're playing you look at the belief uh, that they're showing as well I do feel like Liverpool out are out of the title race now I really do but if Arsenal drop points at Spurs is it not back on for them 
slightly, but I just not got no confidence with the way that they're playing at the moment. They they look like a team that's pretty much beaten. They have been doing for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that's that's the big biggest issue. They look like they've um, lost a bit of belief, especially when they, you know, when Liverpool go behind the whole season, they've been coming back, and then recently it seems like they've when it's level, they've been creating all these chances and missing them, and then as soon as they go behind, it seems as though they're missed, they're they're losing that bit of belief, and they're losing that um, belief you need to keep coming back from those. Um, uh, when you go down so I think that's a big concern from Klopp and it looks like his farewell season isn't going to have the fairy tale ending at, yeah at it's, Although it's, you it's never going out with a bit of a whimper you it does seem like it's going down with a bit of a whimper with the way they went, went out of Europe after going out to Europe um, out of Europe to Atalanta you know 3-0 at home to Atalanta is just not good enough whatever Liverpool side show up and then you go and lose 1-0 at home to Crystal Palace and now this result uh, just after the Fulham game which was quite impressive from them mm. it does seem like it's just going down with a bit of a whimper it does at the moment but you never know if you know if Spurs beat Arsenal and Liverpool win all of a sudden they're back level on points and you can't be out of it if you're level on points with top can you I get that but I, for the whole season up until that Crystal Palace game they'd lost like two all season right correct and now they've lost two in the space of two weeks mm -hmm. so I mean I think that tells you everything you need to know of the way that this Liverpool season is going and they got West Ham away next and I don't not even have confidence they go and win that game. Yeah, not easy game. Uh, let's finish off talking about Manchester United. 4-2 win over Sheffield United at Old Trafford. Tim went for 3-1. I went for 2-1. So we both get a point on the board for this one. I actually thought Man U were, were heavily dominant and uh, Sheffield United kept getting goals against the run of play. Uh, I think they went 1-0 up. They went 2-1 up. Man U kept coming back and I think the dominance showed uh, by the end of the game and they won the game 4-2. Yeah, and um, look, Fine win for Man United again. The vulnerability is still there. Um, they'll be disappointed um, with um, they'll be they'll be disappointed with the what manner they conceded the goals of Bogle from a corner, I believe, then Diaz on the breakaway. Um, but there was the result was never really in doubt. I thought Bruno played really well during the game, and he was buzzing around, and he was someone that Sheffield United couldn't handle. And um, look, they got the win in the end today. It's not going to be a win that convinces anyone that they're on the right track. Um, they had to seal it late on with uh, with Hoyland uh, right at the end of the game to, to make the um, victory uh, sealed. And of the, obviously, we know Sheffield United are down anyway, pretty much. But um wasn't a, I wouldn't say a performance or a result, which uh, was convincing oh, massively. Yeah, agreed. But uh, look, it was a deserved deserve victory. But you're talking about a, a team that's essentially down, probably the worst team in the Premier League this season. So, man, you get the job done. In terms of star man, Sim went for Rasmus Hoyland, who got a goal uh, right at the end of that 4-2 win against Sheffield United. I was looking at that game and I was like, ah, oh, Rasmus hasn't scored. Rasmus hasn't scored. And I was like, finally, he bloody scored. <laughs> right at the end. Come on, Rasmus. And, and Diogo Jota was ruled out for two weeks just before, uh, well, the day before Liverpool played. So, that was a bit of a kick in the teeth for me. But, uh, yeah, that brings an end to our Predict the Prem this week thank you everyone for watching us today we'll be back tomorrow for an episode of predict the prem thank you everyone for joining us today we'll see you next